Welcome back. We're going to go through some of the strategic layer now. Every campaign in XCOM is divided into two separate aspects. You have the tactical layer, which is soldiers trying to shoot stuff and not get shot back on the ground. And then you have the strategic layer, which is base management, what research you prioritize, whether you're willing to give stuff away to the council, etc., etc. Um, I've already clicked some of the menus here just to, get to stop paging the commander, um, in that case that's me, I guess to go to various aspects of the base. Um, Long War expects that you already know that, but the game, I guess, is hard-coded to still consistently page the commander after the first mission. Commander to mission control. Commander to mission control. I guess I forgot one. Hang on one second. All right. So first we'll head over to the research labs. Commander, I realize our troops have to put their own survival first, but every alien we use explosives against is one less opportunity to recover new artifacts. So, the problem with um, using explosives is that you don't get corpses back. That's why the goal was to get five sectoid, pardon me, five sectoid corpses last mission, not five dead sectoids. It's far easier to kill things with explosives, but when you do so, you don't get weapon fragments, which are used for weapons research, and you don't get corpses, which are used for all kinds of research. So we will start a research project right now, and we have three options, one of which is actually not doable because we lack the adequate resources with which to do it. So we're going to start with xenobio uh, xenobiology, and as you can see, it requires five sectoid corpses. Had we finished the first mission without actually collecting five corpses, that might also have meant that we wouldn't have gotten enough weapon fragments because corpses and fragments go hand in hand. And if that's the case, we would have started this campaign without the ability to actually do any research. Our laboratory would have sat idle while the campaign progressed, and that's a early death knell for your campaign. Um, largely to the point that I would have considered starting over had we failed to collect the requisite corpses in that first mission. In any event, we're going to cover xenobiology first, because it's on the critical path, both for a mech rush as well as for a um, capture rush. When we get done with that, we're going to make a quick bump over to alien materials, provided that we have the requisite materials to do that research, because it unlocks a lot of good council requests, which will in turn give us engineers and scientists, which let us do faster research and more efficient building. So let's start our xenobiology research, which we will not finish until halfway through the month. Since the complexities of our latest research projects are overwhelming the current staff, I hope you'll consider seeking out additional scientists to bolster the team. So, that's also a key difference between XCOM Long War and XCOM Vanilla. In XCOM Vanilla, you would get alien abductions, and you could choose from two or three different locations and have to ignore the remainder. Each location would give you a different reward. Um, if you've played XCOM 2, when you get the um, priority target council missions, where you choose from three different locations and each have a different reward and different difficulty levels and so on, that's essentially the XCOM, pardon me, XCOM 2 version of how XCOM 1 played. That's not how it works anymore. You no longer get reward engineers or reward scientists from alien abductions, but you also don't have to choose which country you help and which countries you ignore. You only get one abduction at a time. But abductions always have cash rewards, and the only way to get soldier, uh, pardon me, um, scientists or engineers comes from council requests. The council, once you've done the requisite research, might request sectoid corpses in exchange for scientists. Um, or they might request Illyrium or Meld and so on. But you have to have done that research first. And that's why we're going to be covering alien materials after this next research, because it unlocks um, alloy trades, it unlocks Illyrium trades, um, and it unlocks Meld trades. Now we'll head over to engineering, where things are really bad. I've already taken a quick peek. In XCOM Vanilla, you had as many steam vents as the game decided to give you, and steam vents are very useful for cheaply getting a bunch of power into your base. Um, they are placed randomly. In XCOM Vanilla, you got a bunch of them, or maybe you would get one, just based on luck. In XCOM Long War, you will always have two, ste pardon me, two steam vents, but their location is random. And in our case, we've gotten screwed. So, our first and most easily accessible steam vent is right in the middle of where we want to build our satellites. Um, this sucks, there's really no way around it. Um, and our other steam vent isn't even on the same side, so we don't get adjacency bonuses. We eventually will need a 2x3 block of satellite uplinks and satellite nexuses, nexi, whatever the relevant plural is. 
and if we want to cover every council nation. Um, I think actually what we're going to do in this game though is we are eventually going to break down this satellite uplink and rebuild it over on this side because we have a nice free 2x3 block that can go right here. Um, we will use this for power, this can be engineering, these down here can be labs I suppose. Um, sheesh. Maybe these should be labs. We have a crummy in initial base layout. If we want to use steam, then we're kind of screwed. Um, we're not going to rush satellites, and in fact we probably can't given our strategy, as well as our base layout. So we're going to stick with this. We will start drilling out over here, because eventually we're going to need to cover both sides of the base. We will build an access lift we'll just so we can get downstairs. I'll send word when the new facility is operational. And freaking steam vent that's right in the middle of anything I might want to do. We're going to build a laboratory because I think it's important to get research jump started. Um, you get a 20% research speed increase for each laboratory that you have, so that's very helpful. And we're eventually going to need more power, and while I hate to do it over here, we're going to build a fission generator right here. Um, our next step is going to be to dig out here. We will drill out and build a steam generator probably sometime in April. The campaign starts in March. Um, this will be a line of labs. Eventually, I guess we will burn down this fission generator and turn it into something a little bit more efficient. This will be our block for workshops. Um, no, this is going to be our block for um, satellites and all that good stuff. This will be our block for workshops, which means our lab can't go there. God, this sucks. All right, I need to think about how I want to build this. I think the correct answer is that we're not going to have a three by two block of workshops. We're going to have a one, two, three, four, five, like a almost L-shaped block of workshops that we will build down here. These will be satellites. I guess that can remain steam. That's our labs. I don't know. We'll see. By the time it becomes an issue that we're running out of power, the campaign will have gotten to the point that we can deal with the fact we've got a really gross-looking base layout. We're also going to build some sawed off shotguns. They are secondary weapons that can only be fired at point blank range, but they hit with shotgun accuracy and shotgun power. And we're going to build a couple of motion trackers. I will show what they do when they actually get built five days from now. I would have liked to have built a shiv, but we don't have the cash for it, so perhaps after the first mission we can do that. Separately, we'll take a look at our barracks. We have 40 soldiers total. Um, we're going to need every one of them and probably some more um, because if we scroll down, you will see that all of these soldiers are presently fatigued that uh, were on the last mission. And then this soldier actually got injured and is going to be out for two thirds of the first month. Um, this works the same way as the fatigue mechanic in XCOM 2, War of the Chosen, where you can take these soldiers out on their next mission, but they'll be automatically injured thereafter. Um, what this means is that you can't power level the same group of super soldiers that you used to in XCOM 2 Vanilla or any version of XCOM 1. Um, you have to rotate through soldiers. They level more slowly, but you also build yourself a nice robust barracks, so if somebody gets killed, it's not the end of the world. Each class from XCOM Vanilla has been split into two, so instead of snipers, now you have scouts or snipers, which can promote. So we have an example of one down here, possibly. Yeah, so this soldier right here. Our snipers specialize in dealing massive amounts of damage from afar, but without sufficient training, they're vulnerable in close combat situations. Can't promote into either the scout, which specializes in lightning reflexes, the ability to dodge overwatch shots, and squad sight, which is the ability to hit stuff from halfway across the map out of regular line of sight range. This is the default sniper ability from XCOM Vanilla. This, I believe, went to the Assault class in XCOM Vanilla, but the Assault class does something different in XCOM Long War. So, next you have what used to be the Heavy in XCOM Vanilla, has been split into the Rocketeer and the Gunner. The Rocketeer carries a regular gun instead of a big heavy gun, but they also have a rocket launcher. 
the gunner specializes in suppression but doesn't get the rocket launcher. Um, so again, that's been split out. Separately, the support class, which used to be your healer um, and also frequently would carry smoke grenades and all that good stuff, has been split into the medic and the engineer. The medic still specializes in med kits, smoke grenades, suppression, overwatch, etc. Um, the engineer specializes in grenades. And then lastly, you have the tactical class, which is the old version of the assault class. The assault class still exists. They get run and gun, which allows them to take a shot after dashing so they can move damn near halfway across the map. Although that can occasionally be a bad thing because you can dash halfway across the map, trigger new aliens, and then be in a lot of trouble. And then you have infantry, whose special ability is that they can fire twice in one round using both actions to fire their gun. That sounds much better than it actually is, especially early on. Because if you have two low accuracy shots, you are really far more likely just to spray a bunch of bullets everywhere than you are to actually connect with both shots. A high level infantry is pretty good, but right now, not so great. You also have the ability on level up to choose something at random. Um, I can pick a different subclass and the game will choose one of the remaining six that aren't in the scout slash sniper tree. So I might get an engineer, I might get a medic, etc. Um, and that's what I'm actually going to do in this case, because this soldier's statistics don't lend themselves particularly well to a scout or a sniper. Average aim is 65, so she's not going to make a good sniper, she already started with below average aim. She's also not going to make a terribly good scout though, because average movement is 13, with the Nigeria bonus, average movement is 14, so she actually is a base 11, which is the lowest possible movement a rookie can start with, soldier. So she would make a rubbish scout as well, so we're going to turn her into, hopefully, something good. The heavy weapons specialist provides a crucial service to the squad. With the rocket launcher in tow, there are demolitions experts. That's actually not great, but I'll take it over either of the other two options. Alright, we also have our first unit who's going to become Just like it with sounds, decent movement and low aim. Provides that we'll become a grenadier. Our squads need. Or an engineer, I guess. Around them better. This unit with high aim and mediocre mobility will become a infantry. The assault class serves as our front line. They're the first ones into a fight and the last ones out. This unit with decent mobility, decent aim, fairly low hit points, fairly low defense, also should probably be a rocketeer. We have another support class here. You are average across the board. Um, let's make you another engineer. This last unit only has 100 experience points. Um, didn't get a kill, which would have given us an additional 20 experience and gotten promotion, but that's okay. Um, we also have the ability to hire further rookies. We don't need to do that right now. Um, we will need more than 40 soldiers, but let's hope we eventually get soldiers from council requests, etc. The hangar is also different. Um, when selecting first, we're going to rename these units. The hangar, you can choose to modify its current weapon loadout to best serve our needs. As you can see, there is a rename button, but it just fills autocomplete options, so we can go from Katz to Miller to Gibson, etc. I can't actually manually edit what a pilot is named, so. Um, one of you in the thread wanted to be a pilot, sorry, no can do. But we will rename these guys just so I can differentiate them a little bit easier. The other item that you have with pilots is the ability to edit their loadout. Eventually we'll get better air-to-air -air combat items, but right now we have the option of avalanche missiles and stingray missiles. And our hit percentages are rubbish. Um, you see we have 25, 40, 55. You get three different stances that you can go up in when you fight a UFO. You have defensive, balanced, and aggressive. Each tier up from defensive gives you an additional 15% chance to hit, but also gives the aliens an additional 15% chance to hit your craft. Early on, because the amount of time that you can manage to get in the air versus an enemy craft is so low, you always want to go aggressive because it's great if you don't get hit, but if you fail to down the UFO, you're going to run out of fighters far faster than they're going to run out of UFOs. So we're going to be going crazy aggressive until such time as we get higher to hit values. Our two options are Stingray missiles and Avalanche missiles. 
For the first month, we're going to be sticking with avalanche missiles, and then we'll try and do a 50-50 split between stingrays and avalanches. Stingrays have limited armor piercing ability. Avalanches have no ability to pierce armor, but they do more damage. So if you're fighting alien UFOs that have no armor, avalanche missiles are your best options. If you're fighting alien UFOs that have a little bit of armor, you'd rather use stingray missiles because they'll pierce that armor and do full damage. The avalanche missiles damage will get vastly reduced by anything that has even a decent amount of armor at all. We're going to need far more than four interceptors. We'll probably need more than six, in fact, to defend our opening continent because the aliens will just send UFO after UFO after UFO and repair time on an interceptor will take, in worst cases, almost an entire month. Next, we'll take a look at the Council. Satellite so, uplink facilities yes, yes. at maximum capacity. Additional uplink required. Unlike XCOM Vanilla, each country gives us money right now, even if they don't have a satellite. They just don't give us their full complement of money. The United States, for example, is giving us 40% of what they ordinarily would give us with 160, because they're still part of the XCOM project. They just don't have full satellite coverage. Each month, if a country is covered, you will get either one engineer or one scientist, based on the country, and you also get a small bonus. Um, in our case, for Nigeria, we get Pax Nigeriana, which is our starting bonus, but each country has a lesser bonus. They're not as powerful as the starting base bonuses, but they can help. We'll monitor that contact, but I don't think it's related to the UFO activity. We're not building any further satellites this month, so we're just going to sort of stick with it as is. Um, we will probably not get out of Nigeria until May at the absolute earliest, in part because we have a different strategy, and in part because our base layout absolutely sucks because of that friggin' steam vent. So that's that. Um, we'll go about renaming soldiers before we hit our first mission, but now we're going to scan and see what our first mission actually is. Ideally, we get an early UFO. Nothing about this is ideal. Excavation complete. Access lift operational. So by failing to get a UFO this early, because you're guaranteed to get three in the first month, that means they're going to come bunched together, and that may also make interceptions difficult. If not this month, then next month. Alright, so our first mission... Commander, we've picked up multiple requests for assistance. Abductions in progress are marked on the hollow globe. ...is a light abduction in Russia. Alien activity ranges from light to moderate to heavy to swarming and describes the number of aliens that will be on the map. Light is the easiest. We'll probably have about seven to ten aliens on the map, which means we'll either have three fairly sizable pods, or pardon me, two fairly sizable pods, or three smaller pods. Um, we're going to send a team of rookies, possibly with one shotgun user on this mission if we can, but we will do that next time, and I will start renaming soldiers off-screen. See you next time.